A key to the electrical conduction system diagram, much this like the Wiggers diagram is for hemodynamics, is you have your SA node with three internodal pathways going to the AV node, and then a little Bachmann's bundle to the left atrium. This is at the right atrial and SVC junction. The AV node is on the atrial side of the fibrous skeleton, which then gives through a hole here in this fibrous skeleton the His fibers that then come down and the His Purkinje system gives off a right bundle, a left bundle that then gives off a left anterior fascicle, a left posterior fascicle, and sometimes we get a septal fascicle here. And this is the normal conduction giving a QRS that is narrow and allowing for apex to base contraction in a systematic synchronized method so that you can get blood going through the pulmonary artery and aorta and uh, with normal contraction. And when I look at axis, I look at AVF, lead one is, this is AVF, and lead two is at 60 degrees. AVL is minus 30. R is minus 150. And three is positive 120. When we look at axis, you can do it roughly looking at F and lead one, but probably the more accurate way that Dr. Hagney once taught me was if you look at two and one and use your left hand thumb as lead one, this is a useless trick, and lead two is your right thumb. If it's positive in one but negative in two, then that means that you're going to have left axis deviation. And left axis deviation, three diagnoses should come to mind. Left anterior fascicular block, left ventricular hypertrophy, or old inferior MI. Now you can get lots of other causes for left axis deviation, but these are three that should come to mind. With right axis deviation, in other words, if it's negative in one and positive in two, it's going to be right axis deviation. And right axis deviation, to add some symmetry, you want to think left posterior fascicular block, RVH, right ventricular hypertrophy, and pulmonary embolism, infarction. Now, right bundle branch block can also be right axis, uh, and left bundle branch block can be left axis. But that's for axis deviation. Now, with YQRS rhythms, we want to be careful Wide QRS means interventricular conduction delay, and usually we divide these, or I divide them into left bundle branch block, 
right bundle branch block or other. And other can be like nonspecific IVCD or sometimes Wolf Parkinson White pattern, pre excitation pattern can be in here. So how do I look at this? I look at lead one, I look at V1, and I look at V6. If I, in left bundle, I see rabbit ears up like this with discordant T waves. In V1, I look at rabbit ears up like that, down in V1, and then in V6, which looks mostly very much like lead, v, lead one, should be rabbit ears up this way. Now, sometimes in lead V1, it will be just a, a QS component that goes straight there. If you take lead V1 and rotate it 90 degrees, it will point to the left. And that's another uses trick for looking for left bundle branch block. So for right bundle branch block, I look at lead one, should give a deep S wave. I look at lead V1, in which I see septal depolarization and R wave, then an S and an R prime, discordant T wave, and then in V6, I look for an S wave like this. If you take lead V1 and you rotate it 90 degrees, the bulk of the QRS will go to the right, implying right bundle branch block. Then in the Wolf Parkinson White, you'll see a short PR, a delta wave, a wide QRS. So that is the delta wave there. So this is how I look at wide QRS rhythm. Okay, for OMG ECGs, oh my goodness, or oh my gosh EKGs, I like to think of the coronary anatomy and what happens in terms of ischemia and infarction. With the coronary anatomy, the left main comes out here, it goes down the anterior interventricular groove, gives off diagonal branches and septal perforators. The left main, this is the left anterior descending artery, with the circumflex comes posteriorly and is kind of a ghost artery or a silent artery because we don't see it as well on the EKG. The right coronary artery goes down the anterior atrioventricular groove and then moves a little posteriorly to the inferior interventricular groove and gives off the posterior descending artery as well as some posterolateral branches and AV nodal branch and RV branch. So the right coronary artery is dominant 80 to 90 percent of the time, and hence we associate it with an inferior MI. Now with the inferior MI, we're looking for ST elevation in one, two, in three, in F, and in lead two, and these are contiguous leads. And this, we would see ST elevation you can either make it a frowny face or tombstone T waves, whatever you want to do. But in the leads one and AVL, we'll see reciprocal ST changes of depression. Now, the distinction between a non-ST elevation MI and an ST elevation MI is ST elevation here. With non-ST cell, and this is a transmural infarction. If this is epicardium and this is endocardium, 
this would be an ST elevation would be transmural infarct. Whereas ST segment depression or ST seg or T wave inversion oftentimes is a marker of endocardial ischemia or endocardial injury or a non-ST elevation MI if we have enzyme elevation. Now, with an inferior MI, I look for three basic changes in addition to that. I look for an RV infarction because if I include the vessel here, I'm going to see an RV infarct in V4R, the right-sided leads, and I'll see a millimeter ST segment elevation. I'll also look for AV nodal conduction abnormalities, such as type 1, second degree AV block, and then I'll also look for posterior MI with ST depression and lead V1. Now if the left anterior descending artery is occluded, I will find anterior MI will give me ST elevation here in 1 and AVL for an anterior MI. But with an, for, I will see in the inferior leads reciprocal changes reciprocal changes in 2, 3, and F. Also with anterior MIs, I'm going to look in V1 through V6. Now, all this ST elevation is not myocardial infarction, sometimes we can get a J here like this with early repolarization. Uh, we can also see global ST elevation in pericarditis. So this is early repol. We see pericarditis in which we see PR depression, ST elevation, and we get the combination in multiple leads, one, two, three, F, sometimes L, and across the precording V1 through V6 for pericarditis. Sometimes we see ST elevation in old Q waves. If we look at the evolution of a myocardial infarction, if I tie off the coronary artery, I can sometimes see initially you have a normal QRS like this. Then what happens initially is the QRS gets taller, wider, the QT gets longer. Then it goes to peak T waves. Then it goes to start getting a little Q wave, an ST elevation. Then it goes to T wave inversion and a Q wave. And then finally we get a significant Q wave, which is one millimeter wide and a third of the QRS in depth. 